Hi folks, it's me at the convention. I'm glad I made it again this time. Um, I'm in an unusual location this time, speaking to you on uh, by the magic of video. I'm in Jackie's illustrious queen office, which is still here after all these years and looks more beautiful than ever, as does Jackie. So um, I'm here to answer some questions. So we're gonna get on with that straight away before I give my um, usual message, okay? Okay, welcome Brian. Um, the you, first Jackie. question is from Aston McNeil. If you hadn't created the Red Special with your father, what guitar would you have used on a regular basis? I suppose anything that I could afford. I had a little pickup which I made, which was on my first acoustic guitar. I don't think that would have got me very far though. Um, I guess I would have got something like a Colorama, a Hofner Colorama that my friend Jag had, or else the, the Hofner V3 which uh, my friend Willie Hamilton had. Um, and that would have been all I could afford up to a certain point. But bringing it forward to now when you could have afforded something better, what if would I could you afford something. I now? think one of my favourite things ever is the, the Gibson SG, the one with the points, the red one with the points. I always love those things. I don't have one, but I always kind of dreamed of finding the perfect one of those. I think they're beautiful and they sound something different. They sound actually, in some instances, instances not that different from my guitar. And. Um, you know, they don't quite have the thickness of the normal Les Paul. They don't have the brittleness of the uh, of the fenders. Um, so that would probably do me very well. Question now from Sharon Wheeler. Uh, how did you feel making Greatest Hits 3 without Freddie? Well, Miss Sharon Wheeler, um, it was a bit of an emotional um, tightrope, really. And I think we all fell off a couple of times. It was very difficult listening to Freddie's voice over and over again making his Greatest Hits 3 album. And um, it, we had great moments of joy, um, certainly when things started to work out. And um, there were moments when the pictures that we were trying to paint actually fooled us as well. And we thought, wow, it does sound like we were in the studio together. Because Greatest Hits 3, of course, we never said so at the time, but it's a kind of what-if album. You know, we put it out hoping that people would enjoy it at face value, in the beginning at least. But of course, really nothing on that album ever really happened. It was, we were never all together in, in the studio making what you hear. There were just moments when certain things happened and we captured those moments and put them all together. So it's a pretty unusual album and I'm glad that it sort of passed that test and it became something that people enjoyed and smiled at rather than feeling it was some kind of, you know, an assemblage of, of museum pieces, you know, which are us, of course. <laughs> um, but um, I'm pretty proud of it, actually. I like that album. I really like it. And I love track 13. I feel very, you know, I think that's a place we'd never been before. And uh, I'm, I'm very fond of that still. Funny, the things that stay with you. Uh, I think Freddie would have been too. You know, there's only a couple of words of his on there, but it's, he's there all the way through. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, yeah, it was a difficult project. And for me, it totally diverted my life because I was trying to make my second solo album to follow up on the first one, which had done well. And by the time I'd spent, I suppose, two and a half years trying to do my bits for this uh, album, the Queen album, mm. I kind of lost my way. So I had to start off again with a solo album, and it all became very late. And it was a very different album from the one it would have been had this not happened. But you know, all these things are meant to be. <laughs> Christine Beauville asks, will you be writing a book about your guitar? I've attempted to write books about the guitar. A few times, sometimes with, a, with help from other people, but again, it's just never happened. Um, one day, maybe, yeah. I'd like to do it with someone who would take the strain off, because I find that if I just immerse myself in projects like I used to do, I get lost from the world, and I don't want to do that anymore. I want to sort of stay present in the world. So I think it, I'd like to do a guitar book, but it's not my absolute priority, and I would like help. Is something like this happen with Greg Fryer on that project? Yes, yeah, yeah, it may happen. In fact, the Greg Fryer thing still may happen as, as regards a book. He's still up for doing it, so perhaps that will happen. Okay. Emma Cherry Young Hughes, great name. <laughs> if you could live as somebody else, who would it be and why? If I could live with someone no, else? No, if you could live as oh, somebody else. Oh, sorry, oh dear. <laughs> uh, if I could live as someone else, who would it be? Um, that's a really There are certain people who I think handle themselves very well, and I th have. A, does that count? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I would be quite proud. I think I'd be proud to say that I was Sting, you know, because I think it, because of his whole career, he's just 
you know, handled himself well. Just, it just made the most of what of the talents he had. You know, hasn't lost his dignity or his, his integrity. Taken a lot of chances. Um, so I, I would be. I think I would be quite proud to be Sting. I mean, he has a fantastic voice. I wish I had his voice. <laughs> um, and also Eric Clapton. You know, I have a great. You know, he's still my hero. I, you don't have many heroes left by the time you're 50 or whatever. You know, <laughs> but he's absolutely still my hero. You know, and. Uh, he's gone down all kinds of dark alleys and made mistakes, you know, but what, what he's done is always grow. And, um, yeah, I just have a great respect, you know. If, if I woke up tomorrow morning and found out I was Eric Clapton, I'd think, hmm, okay, I can, I can have some respect <laughs> for this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Aston asks, what is the funniest or most embarrassing thing that happened on stage with Queen? Well, the one that first comes to mind, the most embarrassing thing, okay, um, probably in Holland when we did this huge and very grand, magnificent opening with The Crown. Uh, oh. I don't know, if, don't know how many of you out there still remember that, um, but it was very magnificent, you know, and um, big moment. Uh, it's a We Will Rock You thing. Freddie goes out and does his little thing. I go out and do my little thing. Um, sometimes that didn't work, and that was embarrassing. You know, I, I can remember Las Vegas where my guitar didn't work at that moment. That was pretty embarrassing. But this was even more embarrassing because Freddie's done his bit, I've done my bit. Big moment, a lot of smoke, the curtain comes off the crown, big roaring noise and it starts to take off like the, um, like the ELO spaceship which, uh, which they nicked off us. Um, and it didn't go up. Instead of going up, half of it went up and half of it went down. So it went more and more like this, <laughs> like it was the Titanic about to disappear beneath the, the stage. So we all ran. <laughs> Actually, the road crew ran first, I gotta tell you. But uh, we sort of went, oh, do we sort of preserve our dignity or our lives here? So eventually we got off the stage and um, it turned out to be one of those things, as often happens, which was special and very nice because when we eventually did get back on and do it properly, there was this great bond between us and the audience because they realized that we're human and mm. stuff can go wrong and we can look like prats and we can still come on and entertain them. You know? So it, it, it was one of the greater nights that I remember. It was a really good night. It's in the Ahoy in Rotterdam, that one. There's a lot of Dutch people in the audience today, so I'm sure they'll remember that. Well, we did a lot of growing up in, in Holland, let me tell you. Judith Wayne asks, do you think time travel will be possible and where or when would you choose to visit if you could? No, oh, I wish it were popular, but I have a feeling as a scientist that it's not gonna be possible. Uh, if I had my choice, I would go back to 1851 and go to the, um, the Great Exhibition in Kensington Gardens and buy all the stereo daguerreotypes. <laughs> <laughs> you probably I got wish. most of them already anyway. <laughs> uh, a few of them have found their way into my hands and there's the, some of the greatest treasures that I have. I just love that, you know, in, in contrast to the Millennium Dome, which I think is an utter and total waste of money and a shameful um, exhibition of just being wrong, you know, I think that's one of the things I'm most ashamed of at the moment, that bloody dome thing with the thing sticking out. <laughs> you know, how many hospitals could you have built mm. instead of that? You know, as a, it, things were very different in 1851, and in, the world was not on the brink of cyberspace or whatever, it was on the brink of being able to show its art and its science to each other, and I think that that exhibition was a fantastic thing. Um, the brainchild of Prince Albert, you know, Queen Victoria's beloved. I wouldn't wish I could have been there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day, who knows. Rachel Pendlebury, had Freddie not become ill and was still with us today, what direction do you think Queen's music would have taken? Oh, what a hard question. I'm sure that we would still have been Queen and we would still have been operational if Freddie was around. That's number one. I know that it would have been worth it, no matter what pain we were in, <laughs> to be Queen. You know, We would have still done our separate stuff, you know, but... Queen would, we would have come back together and, and kept on as Queen, I'm, I know that for certain. What we would have been doing, I don't know, because Queen never went in a straight line, ever. And I'm really proud of that. I, I'm glad that we never sort of traversed the same path twice. And um, I think we would have hammered out all kinds of weird new stuff. And we would, you know, we always trod this line of being kind of dimly aware of what the world was expecting, but also not wanting to be what they expected. Mm. Um, so you see our development very parallel. Um, and I think we would, have, um, we would have looked interesting alongside the present trends. I don't, know, I don't know if that quite makes sense, but I can see us 
incorporating some of the stuff which has happened recently, but not just sort of following other people, being ourselves. Excuse me. You know, and, and strange things happen. You know, I, I look back on that um, news of the world period with great interest now, because we became kind of reborn in the sense of uh, we went back to basics, but that was our decision. You know, a lot of people think we did that because of, you know, the sex pistols or something. But it's not true. You know, we found ourselves in um, in that strange um, converted church in North London, and the Sex Pistols were in the other studio trying to make their first album and not succeeding at that point. Um, but we were already doing this stuff like Roger was doing. You know, uh, mm. and the, we were Rocky and we were Champions. We're all, we're already born. Um, so you get this strange kind of reflection within you of what is going on outside you. Very funny. I'm babbling on here. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> but I had a very interesting conversation with Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters, you know, because he's a young punk, really, mm. you know. And God bless him, you know, he's a great musician, great drummer, and everything. But he has this great awareness, which American musicians tend to have, of the whole big picture. And he said to me, These assholes think that punk was invented with the Sex Pistols. Don't they realize that the Who were the first punk group? Probably, you know, even if it started there, it yeah. was. You know, and all that happens is people get different slants on things and the media pick up on something and give it a name and think they've invented something, you know. Things are very complex and I'm glad that we were able to be a part of um, all that development that went on. That's enough now. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Not a chance. It's on to the next question. Now your children, this is Dave Newman, now your children are older, are they showing career tendencies in science or in music or in a, in a complete other direction? Well, I'm wary about talking about my children because it exposes them too much, so I'm not going to say too much. All I will say is that I haven't pushed any of them into music. I think they all have a certain affinity for it, but um, they have their own talents and their own paths to follow. And uh, I just want to be uh, intelligent and caring enough to, to, to nurture what they want to do. Um, strangely enough, I, I can kind of answer the question because I think all three of them have the same kind of duality that I did, you know, they, they like art but they also like science, it's a shame that they have to choose, because um, in the old days, you know, Leonardo da Vinci did not have to choose, and, um, and I'm lucky that I can still preserve all those things, you know, I have these, inter these great passions which are really at the opposite ends of the spectrum as far as schools are concerned, you know, I'm into um, music which is an art, you know, I'm into history I suppose because I'm into mm -hmm. the photographs with a great passion and I love what astronomy stimulates in me, you know, I still do that. So I'm very lucky that I'm able to keep that up. <laughs> Rachel Heath, no, this is a funny one. Rachel Heath. Rachel Heath and probably most of the other ladies sitting out there in the convention room at the moment has asked, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I think we should explain well, that that's probably rather difficult but I'm going to have to think very carefully before I answer <laughs> any of you. <laughs> it's very kind. What a lovely thing to be asked. Yes. I, that means a great deal to me, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I don't think uh, if you knew me, you might be so keen. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you feel that way. Boy. <laughs> well, I've been married once so far. You know, and, uh, we shall see. Barbara Reddy. Are you working on another album? If so, when is it likely to be released? I'm not working on an album. For the first time in my life, I'm not. And I'm quite happy about that, because I'm going, to, I'm going to do it when it seems to be right. I'm doing other projects, just a few things which I've really felt that I would enjoy and would be fulfilling in their own right. I'm trying to be a, a non-codependent person these days, which means that I'm trying to not do what everybody else asks me to do, just because I don't want to disappoint them. Now that's taken me 52 years to get to, and um, it's changed my life a lot. So I'm not, you know, becoming a workaholic at this time of my life. You know, I'm going the other way. Having said that, I'm doing a lot of nice things, which I'm enjoying. You know, I just did the Foo Fighters thing, which I really enjoy. Um, I did the thing with Five, which I also enjoyed. You know, I have no, you know, there are people who have gone to me, why do you want to do that, you know, with a boy band? I want to do it because it's good music and gets to a new audience and um, and I like the guys. You know, I think they have a lot to offer. Um, what else am I doing? The Fourier soundtrack is coming out, which I did for this French film, 
and very proud of that. It's a very difficult film to watch, guys. You know, I hope that you'll all get to see it if you want to, but be prepared. It's not an easy thing to watch. It's very, it's a kind of painful film to watch, physically. I mean, I'm I'm very squeamish about that. Um, you know, I I can deal with people beating each other up in a fair fight. I can't deal with people being tortured very easily, and that's what a lot of the film is about. Oh, <laughs> cut. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> with Andy Bell asks, do you feel more fulfilled and content as a solo artist than, as, than you did as a member of Queen? God, these questions are good, aren't they? I just wish I had good answers. I feel like I love doing stuff on my own, and it, it's always been a dream that I could do that. But you get to a certain point, and I know John Lennon said the same thing, where you look around the room and you wish that everyone was there. And it's a balance thing, I suppose, you know, and I wish that Queen was still there so I could still have my balance in that direction, yeah. Because I know that some wonderful things happened just because of the way we interacted as a band, as human beings, and I miss that. I make no bones about it, I miss that very often. You know, I've had a lot of, uh, I've been given a lot of leash as a solo artist, and it's great. But, I mean, particularly at a time like this, I think, yeah, if I could walk back into the studio with, with the other three, it would be wonderful. It would be so stimulating. Um, I've had some of the most fulfilling moments in both spheres. You know, I, I can remember those wonderful moments in Queen where you were part of something obviously explosive and enormous and you, you never dreamed that you would be in that place. And I can remember moments of the solo tours in a couple that I did which were also really blinding, you know, where I actually experienced the audience firsthand as a front person, um, those were unforgettable, you know, and I know that there were moments after I got over my nerves and my initial kind of inadequacies as, you know, trying to do everything at once, where I was ob able to kind of open up and be very honest in a way that I couldn't as a guitar player, you know, I was kind of an accessory to the fact as a guitar player, but as a, as a singer I could say, hey look, I feel this, really, I do, and um, that, that, some of that was wonderful. So the answer to the question is I like it all and I, and I suppose I still want it all. But I want my life. You know, that's the other balance thing. You know, and because of that I, I cannot any longer be on the road the whole time or be in, on, in the studio the whole time. It's really important for me as a human being to be a, to be a living human being and not a human, not a human doing. <laughs> this is Cottonwood language. <laughs> don't be a human being. Be a hu no, sorry. Be a human being, but don't be a human doing. Because you forget yourself. You become someone who does and does and does and does. And what happened to the person? Penny Johnson, looking back on your life and also your career, which of your achievements are you most proud of? What am I most proud of? I think I'm... This is all gut reaction because I haven't been through the questions no. with Jackie up to this point at all, so it's all reacting blind. I'm most proud of stuff which I think I created, I think, which would be mostly the things that I wrote. That's my gut reaction. So We Will Rock You I feel immensely proud of because um, it's gone such a long way in so many different forms and it's become part of everyday life for people. Something like Who Wants to Live Forever, I'm very proud of. Uh, Too Much Love Will Kill You, I'm proud of. Because that was, to kind of expose yourself that much is, is an extreme place to go. Uh, and um, what else? At the next level, I'm proud of the way I was part of those interactions. I'm very proud of Bohemian Rhapsody. Proud is a strange word, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking what it means. You know, proud means you're proud of yourself, really. But you're also proud of your friends and you're proud of the whole team. You know, us as a touring team was a great thing to be proud of because everyone was interdependent, as if you were fighting a war. And we were very much aware that the show depended as much on the lowest guy assisting the assistant to the lighting director as it did on us. You know, if anyone screwed up, that show would be no good. So it was a great feeling of pride we had in our crew. And I still feel that our touring operation was the best that the world has ever seen. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot. Even now people say that, don't they? Like the Queen Machine was a... It was, was a something machine. so special and wonderful and everyone took a pride. And uh, boy, you know, so any one of those gigs I would say I was proud of. Whether it's Live Aid, whether it's 
what's coming to mind, Budapest or Wembley, Leeds, uh, there's so many exceptionally great nights which could only come about if everyone is exceptional, not just us. So I feel immensely proud of that. Brian Harding asks, on stage, can you get any appreciation of the amount of excitement and joy created every time you perform? For instance, the atmosphere at Wolverhampton when you joined Roger on stage was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can feel that directly. It's a nice question. <sighs> Although you're not aware of everybody's individual reactions, you get an incredibly strong feeling on stage, and I think everyone would tell you this, of a mood and, and a level of energy and excitement. And yeah, Wolverhampton with Roger, I felt it, yeah. And it's a joy to be able to, to give people that. Um, and it was something special and everybody knew it, you know, I wasn't going to be on stage with Roger every night, you know. And, um, it was a moment in time which, which just a few people can share. I don't know how many people were there, just a couple of thousand or something. Yeah. But that never happened any other time except that night in Wolverhampton. And I felt it too. I feel it in, a, in, a, in my guts. And uh, I loved it. I had a great time. And uh, it is a special privilege to be able to go on to other people's shows and do something, you know. In that case it was with Roger. But like when I went on with the Foo Fighters or going on with Five at the Brits, no, that's not quite the same. No, we, we, we sort of organised that. But when you go on spontaneously, like actually I went on with Five. When they did Wembley, you did. When they, they did Wembley, mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't expect many of you guys were there, you know, because there was a lot of very, very young girls, not many boys, I should think. You know. <laughs> but to be able, for me, the old rock star, to be able to go on there and get that kind of lift from that audience was quite something for me, because I just thought, okay, I can, I can feel that, that, that I'm able to do something. Uh, but I'm also aware that it's not just me they're reacting to, they're reacting to the specialness of the occasion. You know, it's their boys with someone that they dimly recognise as being kind of <laughs> important over there. And they know it, it's special. And I think we all like specialness, don't we? We all like to be made to feel special. And, uh, it's one of the best feelings there is, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adele Burnett says, when on tour, Keith Richards will apparently not leave home without a huge supply of HP sauce and homemade shepherd's pie. <laughs> Is there anything you take with you on tour knowing you couldn't get it and can't live without it? I used to, but I got out of the habit because I think it's uh, one of those childish things which you can leave behind. What sorry, Keith, I'm sorry if you <laughs> feel that way. But just the same as, you know, my kids used to always need to have uh, HP baked beans and... and uh, Tomato soup was another thing. You know, nowadays they don't. They just, if we go someplace, they they're able to take in what is what is around them. And I would much prefer to do that. I would rather just be open to what's being offered. But when you did take something, what was it? Do you remember? Ah, I used to take all these supplies. I used to take a special suitcase of all these medications that I thought I might need. You know, and, and <laughs> packets of biscuits and chocolate and stuff, you know. But right. no, no, not now. I like to be open. You know, life is to be experienced. And to experience, you have to lay yourself open. I think. So no, not anymore. i tell you what I do take. I take a packet of Imigrand because I haven't found anything which will cure a bad migraine except that. Oh. <laughs> it's about the one thing which I make sure I have with me. Sarah Turton asks, who would you most like to play a gig with? Oh, very interesting. Um, uh, the Beatles, probably. Mm. That's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> um, hmm. It's really, really hard. Can we come back to that? I can't think. Come back to There's that. a lot of people that I wouldn't like to be, but we ain't going to talk about that. No, 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 no. Let's be positive. But, uh, I mean, the Foo Fighters would. You know, if I was going to choose one of the, the modern bands, they would be. You know, right up there. So I'm a very lucky boy. I tend to get to do a lot of the stuff mm. I want to do. Um, who else is there that's great out there? There's a lot of people I like from different fields now. Um, let's come back to it. I don't know. Okay. Michelle McWinney. <laughs> now you can probably put put the rest on this one for for good and all. Is there a studio version of Hangman? 
Queen apparently played it live in the 70s, early 70s. Don't think so. We've always been told no. there isn't, but... No, so I think there's a lot of live versions. I don't think we even tried in the studio. I don't think so. That's my guess. I tell you who would know, Mr Brooks, who's been going through the tapes. he will be with us and later he will this week. Oh, he will? Well, he you will. should ask him that. I don't know. I don't think I would have considered it worthwhile, because we never really kicked it into the point where it was a... Uh, well, yeah, it just wasn't developed enough. Simon Turton, must be married to Sarah Turton, what is the one thing you regret you never did? <laughs> I could be unoriginal because I know what Albert Einstein's answer to that question was. And Do you know what was? that is? No, I don't, I don't. They said, Mr Einstein, you've achieved all this. Is there something that you wish you'd been able to do? And he said, I wish I'd been able to stay with one woman all my life. Really, I think, isn't it? Maybe. So I think I would, I would join him on that, you know, <laughs> because that would make life, you know, and it would stop you going to those places where you fall apart. I suppose, and it would be something to be proud of in a big sense. What would I wish I'd done? I wish, I wish, I wish. Do you know? I think I wish that I had kind of faced my fears earlier. I suppose maybe I should have done it in my twenties. But I, I had too good a life to have to face them, and it had only happened recently. And I know that I'm a much better person for having been to that worst place in the world, you know, my room 101 or whatever. <laughs> um, and I suppose I feel that if I'd got there a little earlier, I might have made a better job of a lot of things over the last 30 years, like my relationships and stuff. But things are meant to be the way they're, they're meant to be, and. Um, I don't actually regret it. I think, you know, I'm just grateful that I got to this point. And I feel grateful for a lot of things these days. That's Chantal Taylor. Which song or songs that you have written reflect your personality the most? Mm. Not answerable, because all of them do, I think, in some way. Mm. I've never hid away. I've always tried to be honest in the songs, sometimes too much so. So, um... There's a big piece of me in everything that I ever put out, I think. Um, some of them better than others. But um, there was always the commitment to put myself into them. So th I'm afraid I can't really do that. Sorry. Paul Brown says, if you had the opportunity, would you like to compose and perform the music for a James Bond film? Yeah, I'd love to do a James Bond thing. Um, I actually wrote one for them at one point, which they rejected out of hand. Uh, <laughs> so I might not bother again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that would be fun. I mean, I'd like to do the theme. I, I wouldn't like to get into doing the whole movie, because that's a big piece of your life. Mm. There's very few films I would like to do that with now. I, I did Fourier, and I had a great time doing it. Totally stimulating, because I just worked one-to-one, eye-to-eye with the director. There was none of this corporate stuff. Mm. So that was really good for me. Um, I'd find it hard. It would have to be a really life-changing film for me to want to spend, you know, a year and a half of my life doing the whole soundtrack. I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I would, you know, if it was something great. I wish I'd been offered um, Sixth Sense, a film like that, which has such depth and such, you know, connection to your inner self. You know, I would love to be offered something like that. It would be amazing. I think I'd prefer that to a James Bond oh. film, really. I thought it should have got the Oscars. <laughs> I liked American Beauty, but I think there's a bit of, well, I know there's a lot of snobbery goes on, mm. you know, the same as all these award things, they're all corrupt, they're all political, they're all carved up by people who have interests in the industry, so somebody's going to sue me for saying this, but the Oscars, <laughs> I know for a fact, you know, I have it on good authority that it's mm. the same there, you know, and I think, um, I would, I would have, I think the fact that the director was an Indian uh, counted against it could be wrong but and the fact that it was a thriller and you know thrillers aren't quite cool you can't get Oscars in thrillers they have to be you know mainstream or whatever. anyway anyway it's not my <laughs> field really sorry I shouldn't even be talking about this Rami Abu Adal I hope I've said that right what do you think is your musical future I think my musical future is in projects and they will just come up and I will feel something for them here he goes, being very vague. <laughs> it's not a very definite answer, is it? Uh, it's to do with the, the wanting to be my own driving force thing. 
I want to arrive at things for the right reasons and not just because I want to please someone else. Um, I'm involved in this isn't okay. This isn't music really, but I'm involved in putting this Indian film, North American Indian film, together, and I'm very passionate about that. And it's sort of coming from me and my friend Dirk, and nowhere else. And I feel good about that because no one's requiring me to do it, and we have a good attitude to each other about how much we expect from each other. Um, so that I feel good about. At the moment, there is no one musical project which I want to do, uh, except I will head towards my next album, and the next album. I would just like to be in a very different place. You know, I don't want to be in a place where I'm preaching to anyone, or you know, <laughs> sort of, or using it as therapy or any of those things. I just want to make a good music album. I had a. Should I share this with you? Hmm. You'll laugh at this, <laughs> but I'm so used to going to restaurants and hating it because I want to sit and talk to someone or I want to sit quietly and think. And there's all this horrible music being forced down my throat as well as the food. I hate that. And sometimes I think I'd like to make an album of music to eat by. Because no one's really done that. I, mean, I, can't, I don't think of anyone who's done it. And if you could succeed and actually make some music which would help your food go down, help the whole experience of eating and being sort of social while you're eating, I think that would be really nice. The closest I've ever come to it is, is those guys who are good and sit at the piano and, and play uh, very sensitive versions of things which you love. You know, That happened to me the other night in the Waldorf with Anita, actually. It was great. And I thought, well, that's the closest you can get. So I don't know if I'm capable of making music to eat by, but I could use it as, a, as an aim, you know. Sad, isn't it, really? I like that. Um, Joanna Butler asks, what has been the proudest moment of your career with Queen? That might be a hard one. Proudest moment <laughs> after all these years. I suppose it was Live Aid, really. I think we were very proud of that. Because... Um, we did it without the trappings which we thought we needed. We thought we needed sound and lights and costumes and the cover of darkness and and we went on with none of those things and just did it and I will always feel proud of that it was a definite um, watershed for us gave us confidence um, and selfishly I mean I remember most of all that final moment with Freddie when we did is this the world we we are created mm, yeah and it was it was very nerve-wracking because it was just the two of us you know, if you'd let yourself go to that place, you would have been too terrified to do it, you know. And it was just an acoustic guitar, you know, where little scratches on your fingers mm. are so obvious. And um, I felt very proud, a sort of one, one second before we got to the end of that, that we actually pulled mm. it off. You know, I just sort of looked at Fred and there was a moment where we thought, ooh, this was a big one, you know, and we <laughs> never really admitted it until this point. And we just sort of shuffled off and, yeah, I think we felt very wow. proud. Two questions in one here, slightly. First from, from Tom Peak. Um, we've been anticipating a box set of rare Queen stuff for many years now. Will we get one and what might be in it? Followed by Alan Small with, what happened to all the extra tracks that were written for the Miracle album and any other albums? If you combine the two, maybe some of those tracks are going to go in a box if they exist even. Yeah, it's all under discussion. We do want to do a rarities box, yeah. And we in the stages of sort of research at the moment and then we'll get to the point where we if we decide when, where we want to work on things and where we don't. Um, the nice thing is that you can go back to those old things which you rejected and not be so precious. You know, I used to think when somebody asked me that question that we would never release any of this stuff. I don't feel that way anymore. And I think, you know, with, with the benefit of hindsight you can be kind of, not exactly patronising, but you can be fond of your former self and and not be so ashamed of, of the kind mistakes. Of all, it's not such a yeah, problem. so these days I, I wouldn't mind people hearing the stuff that we rejected. It wouldn't bother me. Same as the Beatles put out that stuff, you know, some of which was very imperfect, but I loved. And I think people probably would have the same feeling. So I think the temptation will be not to work on it too much and just put it out and let people see what we went through. Abby Layton, <coughs> excuse me. When will you release all your solo videos on one compilation? Because you've My got lots now. Videos. Yes, your solo videos. Um, it's a point. I hadn't thought of it. That'd be nice. Maybe, be good. maybe I could do that. Maybe I could. That's when we maybe that's one, one of those more. projects. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, most of them people haven't seen, I'm sure. 
They see them here every week, every Do convention they? time. Oh, yes. yes. And they all go down a storm, you see, so Do they'd they? like one little compilation for home. So. Good idea. Okay. okay. Helen Livingstone. Do you still plan to release the Royal Albert Hall show on video, and if so, when? Yeah, it's just one of those things which has got put on the back burner. I saw it and liked some of it and hated some of it, and I sort of, I sort of hesitated, but I would like to put it out, yeah. Um, you do wonder, because there's not a big market for that. I mean, I'm sure you guys out there would be interested, but the world at large would probably be very massively disinterested in Brian May at the Albert Hall at that point, you know, at this point in time. So there's a part of me which thinks, well, maybe it's not the right time yet. Um, you know, if I put out stuff at the moment, that's partly why I don't plunge into a new album. There's no airplay possibility in this country now, or in a lot of other countries. There's all this kind of attitude where it has to be, you know, kids, and, and it has to be certain, certain kinds of style and format which I don't fit into. You know, so why are you going to put out an album which you cannot um, promote and you can't sell to anyone except people who already would kind of buy anything you did anyway? You know, that's not. I'm not putting down people who, who like what I do, but you do have this terrible feeling that. Being a musician, you know, like, I suppose a commercial musician like we've been, you know, I don't count commercial as something bad in a sense. You know, you're making music which you hope people will want and need, and want to embrace. You know, and <clears throat> for that, you need to feel that you're breaking new ground all the time, or else you're kind of fossilized. You know, you're kind of dead, and um, that's partly why. You know, so that's why the video for the Albert Hall doesn't get put out because I'm thinking, well, does it say anything new, and am I getting to anybody new? You know, I would be happy to sort of give it to all the, the people who <laughs> who really, really would love it, you know, and, and, and be they done with it. They all start, they're all shouting out there by this point. Yeah, you know? I think they would <laughs> chuck, chuck it on the internet <laughs> or something, you know. Uh, somebody probably has already, you know. Oh, no, I haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Andrew Hogan asks, what is your most nerve-wracking moment? Most nerve-wracking moment? Oh, I don't know if we can go into all that. <laughs> What professional moment, shall we say? Professional moment, possibly. Well, maybe not musical. I mean, you've done TV, <laughs> you've done interviews. Maybe there's something amongst all that was particularly nerve-wracking. Live TV is always very nerve-wracking. For some reason, it just feels worse than anything else. But you and can't I, take back what you've said. <laughs> yeah, and TV is such an artificial medium. I think we never had time to get used to it. You know, being filmed on stage is one thing. You know, so we were in front of an audience at the Freddie Tribute. And it was being filmed. It was it was going out live, live, mm. and that was nerve wracking. But at least you have the audience, and you you're sort of focused on that. When you're just in a TV studio with four walls and a load of technicians around you, uh, and all you can think of is that there's a billion people out there who are going to see you make a mistake. It's horrible, and, and I've always found it hard. Whether you're talking or whether you're playing or whatever, it, it's tough. I think um, if you're doing it every day, I'm sure you get used to it. I always feel like a victim if I'm being interviewed on TV because the guy who's interviewing me has been doing it every day of his life for the last whatever, you know, and he's well aware to, to manipulate the situation to get across what he wants. I am not, you know, I don't do this every day. It's, it's you know, it it's makes me nervous and by the time it's finished, it seems like it's hardly started to me. So that's tough. And the musical moment, I remember, is Saturday Night Live, which we did again totally live mm. in where did we do it was it Los Angeles I can't remember I think it was and um, it was terrifying really terrifying because not only did you have to do it live but you had to be like you had to start at exactly the right second and stop at exactly the right second that sort of stuff and and um, I screwed it up completely <laughs> I saw I've a, got a copy of that somewhere. yeah I have unfortunately I'm sure a lot of other people have yeah I saw poor old um, What's his name? Hagman, who played JR on oh. a TV programme last night, singing at the Queen Mother's um, birthday party or something. And he was singing this song and he totally screwed it up and had to stop and start again. <laughs> totally screwed it up the second time and had to say, Sorry, I can't do this. You know, the, and I really oh. felt for him, you know, watching the film and doing it. It wasn't quite that bad for me. But when it came to the solo, you know, I only get one solo in the song and it was all. Yeah, something happened. I don't know. My fingers were in the wrong place, and by the time you figured why the right sounds aren't coming out, it's gone. You know, and I only vindicated myself by playing some reasonably good stuff at the end on the, on the player. <laughs> you know, so if I'm watching it, I prefer to snip out the solo.
but it's me. And again, looking back, I don't care so much, because that was me in those days. It would be different these days. It would be perfect now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wouldn't. <laughs> Steve Borkowski yes. asks, with all you've accomplished in your career, do you have any ambitions left musically? It would take too long to even figure out what they are. Um, I just really, my ambition is just to be more fruitful and more honest and more present in my music. You know, in some ways I think I haven't been enough. You know, I've always striven for that stuff, but I haven't always achieved it. And um, that's, that's all really. It's hard for me to say more than that. Um, and I have spent a lot of my time doing stuff which was peripheral. And I don't want to do that anymore. Um, you know, you, I suppose it's the equivalent of, of doing a wonderful job on painting the frame around your door. Sometimes I've done that. You know, and I'm very proud of it when I finish it, but then I think, well, why did I spend that time doing that as opposed to something which really would have stayed with the world? So I'd like to, I'd like to have more of a... I'd like to be more proud of my choices, I think. David Backhouse, and many others obviously, Roger hinted at a new Queen album. Will the three of you ever record together again? I think it's possible now, but I don't know when or where or if, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say. Okay. I'm thinking it, w it might be nice. You think so? I don't know.